I'm Spencer Mazik, and joining me now is lawyer turned master of wine, Lisa Granick. She is also the founder of Tasting Works, a management consulting company for wineries and wine related businesses. Welcome, Lisa. Thank, Thank you, you for Rick. joining us today. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. So, master of wine, I like the title, but you got to tell us what does it take to become one and what exactly does it mean? Well, master of wine, we're commonly called MWs. There is a, an institute, the Institute of Masters of Wine in London, which since 1953 has set um, a program for professionals in the wine trade. Partly it's because England has, doesn't, until recently, hasn't produced any wine, um, but it had a rel you know, an established wine trade. And it was a professional organization that basically wanted to organize what effectively would be called a, a bar exam for people in the trade so that they oh. could hold themselves out as experts as being masters of wine. To become a master of wine, there were not American masters of wine until the very early 1990s. Initially, it was exclusively an English organization. Hmm. It's now an international organization with about 300 members. But to become one, one has to have been in the trade for a certain number of years, minimally about five, because you need a wealth of experience. Well, what does being in the trade mean exactly? It means, well, it, you, there are lots of different things one can be if one is so-called in the trade. You could be a journalist. Initially, journalists were not included, but wine journalists are included. You can be a wine maker, a wine grower, um, a uh, somebody who sells wine in a variety of capacities, whether you're an importer or a distributor. Um, and I'm trying to think, that, you know, basically anybody who works in some capacity in the world of wine is considered to be in the trade. Well, and I heard that it takes military discipline to actually get the title, and not everybody that starts out on the journey completes it. Is that true? That's absolutely true. I mean, actually, you don't just start out and say, I'm going to become a master okay. of wine. <laughs> There's ordinarily people have, they do have backgrounds in viticulture and, and, and or enology, or they have taken other classes in wine appreciation and wine tasting and under an understanding about the whole world of wine. Just the process need, from start to finish. You need to, to even enter the MW program. You're at, um, you're way behind the eight ball unless you already know how wine is made, how it is grown, I should have even started there, and then, and, and how that applies throughout the entire world. If you only know about the wines of California, you're in big trouble because the <laughs> MW is, a, is really covering the global wine trade. And it then involves a several year course of study that's largely done on a tutorial basis that culminates in it's a- It's self-taught then. Um, well, there are, there are programs in once a year, depending on what, where you are in the world and where you choose to go, in Roost in Austria, mm -hmm. in Napa Valley, and in Australia. And you spend about a week learning about blind tasting and then listening in on a variety of seminars that involve everything or anything about the wine trade that really intended to just expand your mind to see how big the world of wine really is because the MW exam is about that entire global world of wine. Well, you said several years, so on average, how long does the process take? The average take? person goes through anywhere from five to actually ten years. Oh gosh, but it ten isn't, years. It, it, can, it can take that long. They're and trying to get it to be a little bit shorter than that. But talk a little bit more just briefly about the exam though at the very end. So the exam has, has three parts. The first part is what we call the practical or the tasting exam, which has, uh, it's three days long and each day you have two hours and 15 minutes you have 12 wines in front of you, and you have to identify what grapes are in the wine, how the wine is made, where it comes from, um, its, its um, longevity, and its quality level, things of, of, of that sort. And the first day typically is 12 white wines, the second day is 12 red wines, and the third day is, uh, can be anything, sparkling, fortified, sweet, red, white. That's what, that's what I actually had, was mixed bag. <laughs> and, 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 and just to identify what it is is insufficient. You have to um, pr you, you identify what the wine is, but then you have to substantiate your answer deductively wow. with, with, with you know, extended reasoning about for the, for the choices that you've made. So, so but, you really are an expert. You have to be an expert by that that's point. That's right. And that's just the tasting portion. The, there are four days of essay on everything about the wine trade from grape growing, wine making, the technical analysis of wine, the business of wine, contemporary issues you know, such as the you know, influence of wine, certain wine writers or the, the fact that you know, wine, the production of wine is predicated on 
arguably an exploited, underpaid wage labor force, health issues and wine, things of that sort. And so you're expected to be able to write coherently on basically any contemporary issue in the world of wine. And then the third part is a research paper or a dissertation that one completes only after one has completed successfully the practical and the theory portions of the exam. Man, I thought taking the bar exam was tough, but this it, sounds this a is little much bit more tougher. It is much more difficult than the bar exam. Well, yes. speaking of the bar exam, though, let's take a step back for just a second. Sure. What did you do after you graduated from Yale Law School? Well, actually, I went. I did my JD at Georgetown, and I got my my doctor, my LLM, and a JSD at Yale. Okay. So I actually I practiced law for a number of years after after I got my JD. I was in private practice and litigation, and then I did public interest work. With with the Ch uh, Children's Defense Fund in in Washington D.C., and then I went back. I went to Yale, and I decided I was going to be. An, I wanted to be an academic, so I had a Fulbright, and I taught law in in Moscow and in Tbilisi in Georgia. Wow. Um, in, the, in the early <laughs> 1990s, I came back uh, to Yale, wrote my dissertation, and then it was upon com I had completed the dissertation, was turning it into a book manuscript when I had des I decided that my train had entered the station. To the wine and, trade and station. I was going, and I was going to change careers, that's right. But why wine though? I mean, obviously you like the taste of it, but surely, I mean, was there much more than that to convince you to make a career Well, actually, of it? I, I, when I decided to change careers, I decided I had to think outside the box. And I sort of took myself back to if I, you know, if I was 17 again, what might I do? If I didn't think about my super ego and, and things of my parents or whatever that mm -hmm. might be, what I thought I should do with my life. Making a living. Whatever, <laughs> right. And I thought, well, I knew I'd be able to make a living with whatever I did, but it was a question of you know what 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 might I do? What was I passionate about? Because I had been passionate about the law, um, and then I had segued into this combining with the Soviet Union, and I'd lost I'd lost that passion. But I'd always had a passion for a passion for things that were international in scope. When I went to law school, I always envisioned a career that, in some vague way, would take me abroad. And I really just thought long and hard about other things that excited me. And when wine came up, I had collected <laughs> wine. I thought, why not? You know, I, I knew that I, I knew my skill set. And I, I knew that I could, and, and the world of wine is so broad. And there, there are so many opportunities if one looks around that one can find a fit. And I thought, you know what? It's, it's worth a gamble. Wow. And I want to go with it. Yeah, and so, I mean, it is obviously a passion of yours, but how are you so sure and how do you identify a passion versus, say, a strong interest, or are they one and the same? I think they're one and the same. And also, at least in terms of choosing a career, I think by the time that I was a little bit older, I had a better sense of myself and what was important to me, so that when I realized I didn't want academia, part of that was because I, I as much as I thought I'd liked the solitary work in academia, I'm not a solitary person. Mm -hmm. and the wine trade is incredibly social, and 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 it, and it is about you know when I talked about you know, having an international career. In some ways, I see myself as an ambassador mm. because I am an ambassador. Of wine. I'm an ambassador of, of a producer's wine to a consumer, and then when I'm talking with producers, I'm certainly the ambassador of the consumer uh. to say this is what a consumer is interested into, and this is what I represent when I go to, when I travel abroad. And you know, I I was in South Africa. I go to Italy. I travel a lot. And I am representing the United States and the American consumer yeah. to these people. And, and so I began, as I thought about what that career would entail, it certainly fit not just a skill set, but a personality type that I thought suited me. Well, so tell us a little bit more about Tasting Works. I mentioned it in the intro. Right. Tell us about the services that it provides. Well, a lot of it really started with the fact that most foreign wineries do not understand the American market. They look at America as the great unwashed, and the, and the, the statistics have shown that we do have, um, and Americans pay more per bottle in wine than any other country in the world. And secondly, we are growing um, our consumption of wine bit by bit and have been on a, a, a slow but steady increase for the past 20 years with very little blips even when there's been recessions. And so producers see this as a gold mine, particularly as there's always been a world glut of wine and consumption in mo most wine producing countries, particularly in Europe, it has declined. The problem is the United States is not just one country. Mm -hmm. It is 50 countries, and the markets are very different. And so partly it's my legal background by being you know, able to say there are 50 different legal regimes that you're dealing with in this country. Yeah, I was going to ask you, too, like right. how do you use your legal background well, and there's, experience? There's a bit of that. Um, it's more in the sense of when one, one is analyzing a wine, it's deductive. 
You, 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 the wine is blind. Just the reasoning. Absolutely. You take what's in, you have no information other than what's sitting in the glass. And you have to taste that wine and with no other information, figure out from, and it's a skill that one develops by what one smells and what one tastes as to how the, you know, what the grape variety is, how the wine was grown and where it was grown and how long it will last. Wow. Um, so, but in terms of the, my, my consulting work, mm -hmm. most producers don't really understand not only the, the legal aspect of the American market, but more the, the complexity of it and what motivates American consumers. And they mostly think that so long as I find a distributor, their work is done and there's much more work that needs to be done. And so I, I work with producers to, to have them understand the market better, mm -hmm. to understand the competition, in, 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 in both in, in their segment and in other segments, and what they need to do to improve their market share and their performance in the American well, market. Well, so it sounds like there's a lot of travel there for you. There is. <laughs> Which <laughs> sounds right. excellent to me. That's right, that's right. Well, so while I have you here, Lisa, though, I have to ask you, can you give us any quick tips on choosing a nice red or white wine? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the, the quick tip is uh, always to experiment and and, Never and never be afraid to experiment. And if you get something and you don't like it, then go back to where you bought it and say, I was actually, it doesn't matter whether you liked it or didn't like it. You want to go back and say, um, I like this because I didn't like this because. And, and you can develop, and the most important thing is to develop a relationship with a wine expert, which is part of the thing I was telling you earlier. I've developed this other uh, business, Gift Box of Wine, where yeah, I offer, where I offer consulting services. And I work with people to understand their palate. And um, it's, there are a couple of different elements. Most of it is developing a registry for people who are getting married or setting up cellars for their children in the way that Europeans used to and that I've done for my nieces and nephews. And I get a sense of what they're looking for. Hmm. And I then develop a program where they can simply, um, if it's a registry, they, they have a program and they can tell their friends, click onto the registry and the friends just point and click and, and they amass their, their own collection or I organize it so that on a regular basis, I ship wines to them that, so that by the time they're ready to drink them, mm -hmm. um, I, am, I include a number of other notes that will explain what the wine is about, how, what its longevity will be, and, and, and give them the opportunity to explore wine in a, in a way that is enlightening for them so that they're ultimately able to learn a little bit and make more informed choices when the time comes. Wow, well that sounds incredible. I somehow need to get on that registry, <laughs> Lisa. But thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. You bet, thanks a lot, it was great. For more information on this or other topics, subscribe to BloombergLaw.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us. Bye everybody. Thank you. All right. Very